Well, I'm, I'm happy to introduce Tarlac McGonagall, who's been at uh, Annenberg for some weeks, maybe even some months, I think weeks. Um, we, we have had a very long and rich experience together. Um, my happiest time with Tarlac, uh, among many, was working on a um, study for the OSCE on um, the um, requirement to have to reflect minority languages in broadcasting statutes in 58 states of the Organization of Security and Cooperation of Europe. This was a, a, a really great project because it, it dealt with minority languages, with representation, with regulation, and with this incredibly complicated process of trying to track 58 countries and come up with recommendations. And it was only Tarlac's patience, his diligence, his dedication that made this uh, totally come to pass. And uh, I'm, I'm always grateful to him for the work that he did on that report. He's part of an organization called EVIR, which um, in Dutch means something or other, but <laughs> <laughs> precisely uh, it's an institute for information research, uh, for research on information issues. And it's a wonderful, wonderful place where I spent uh, a couple of months, I don't know, in 1994, I think. And uh, Tarlac was just a junior person there, uh, having come from Ireland, having met and married a Dutch wife and having established himself at this research institute. And since then, he's been very uh, um, ably committed as a kind of rising researcher there and a rising scholar to organize and strengthen this institute. And I, I recommend everybody working together with them, and Tarlac might want to say a few words about the institute. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Tarlac. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Monroe, and uh, thanks, thanks for joining us by, by phone. After that glowing introduction, I should immediately start with expectation management. Um, I won't uh, translate what Institute for Informatiecht means. It's much better to keep it intriguing uh, the way you did, but the, the, the essence is right. We're, we focus primarily on information law, and what that means from day to day is, uh, can be very subjectively interpreted. Uh, essentially, we, we, we deal with uh, a whole range of issues touching on freedom of expression, media regulation, copyright, privacy, the interface between new technologies, law policy, uh, and practice. It's a very dynamic institute and uh, um, delighted to be here um, and, and renew the institutional ties. So before I start, just a word of thanks to uh, Andrea for um, setting up this, uh, this event, uh, despite the best efforts of wayward emails as we tried to organize it. And thanks very much to you, Monroe, and also to Laura uh, for setting up my uh, research period here. It's been, it's been great just to interact with so many people, tap into ongoing research, and pick up on ideas generally by osmosis. Um, it's customary to start with a disclaimer. Uh, but I'm going to start with a war. My subject matter today is very messy, and um, it's unlikely that it'll be any less messy by the time I'm finished. Um, the two and a half summary of my talk is that the European Court of Human Rights has traditionally been a, a staunch defender of the right to freedom of expression, particularly for journalists and media professionals. But we've now reached a point where because of the advent of new technologies and their impact on how we communicate, uh, not just interpersonally, but to wider audiences, that, that the traditional uh, approach of the European Court of Human Rights is very much um, up for rethinking and even recalibration. So I'll be exploring that. Um, I'm going to keep it very conversational, very informal, so please uh, jump in whenever I say anything you want to contest or, 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 or approve of, or if you've generally got any contributions to the, to the, um, to the uh, approach that I'm taking. Um, and without further ado, this is what I'd, um, this is my map to try and bring coherence to the messiness ahead. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a very brief contextualization of Article 10 of the European Court of Human Rights, just so we clear about our point of departure. 
Um, then I will examine whether this notion of an enhanced level of protection for freedom of expression for journalists or the media can, be, can rightly be seen as a principle or whether through its application in uh, case law has become more of a slogan uh, than a, a hard-hitting principle. After Can you get closer to the speaker of the phone or something? Okay, it's right under my chin. Um, okay. Um, then I'll, I'll do some terminological troubleshooting and conceptual confusion. I'll take apart the principle, explain why it's time for soul searching, and the main reasons for that are doctrinal developments, which are driven by technological and practical developments, and then I hope to become more and more interactive and get you, all of you involved with uh, appropriate regulatory and policy responses, and then there'll be explicit unapologetic crowdsourcing at the end to get your input. Okay, um, so that's the um, itinerary. Um, Article 10 of the European Court of Human, uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights, um, I won't read it word by word, just comment on its structure. The first paragraph sets out in broad terms the scope and the substance of the right. Uh, it will include the freedom to hold opinions, receive and impart information ideas without interference by public authority and regardless of frontiers. Immediately then, in the, in the second um, paragraph, uh, it begins to uh, trammel the scope of that uh, protection. If you see there, it immediately states the exercise of these freedoms, since it carries with it duties and responsibilities, may be subject to certain, well, you could summarize it as restrictions, but they're very uh, bureaucratic. They talk about formalities, conditions, restrictions, or penalties. And then it introduces a number of conditions which those restrictions have to meet in practice in order for them to pass uh, muster. What's crucial for the rest of the talk is that you focus on this um, small phrase, but very important phrase, the duties and responsibilities that govern the exercise of the right. Because once we start talking later on about the enhanced level of uh, uh, freedom of expression for journalists and the media, we will see that there is a trade-off for that, namely the expectation that journalists and uh, media actors would uh, um, adhere to the duties and responsibilities that are particular to their role in democratic society. It was written only in English. The, the declaration. Um, it's it's a, it's available in English and French. And uh, then there are unofficial How translations, they obviously. Snap on each other. Um, pretty consistently, because it was a formal bilingual policy at the time, and uh, it was. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any um, uh, noticeable discrepancies. Uh, certainly not in regard of uh, Article Ten. But I'm intrigued as to wh why you. I'm just because language is messy. Yeah. And, you know, you can see how people would understand it differently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Souls are even messier. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not aware of any relevant discrepancies uh, there. Um, okay, so in summary, uh, and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's great being Irish when you're introducing uh, freedom of expression as enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights. You just pluck one of the national symbols uh, and you explain it in that way. If you look at the stem, for the uh, shamrock there. That's the unitary provision protecting uh, the right to freedom of expression. And then it, compo it's co it comprises three distinct parts, the freedom to hold opinions, receive and impart ideas, uh, uh, and information. You'll note there that there's no explicit reference to the right to seek information or ideas. Uh, however, that has been read into uh, the scope pretty much read into the scope of Article 10 by the European Court of Human Rights. And that's, I think, very relevant for what comes, comes later when we look at uh, news making and contributions to public debate, that you would have uh, a recognized right to actually seek information that's out there. And secondly, this symbol is useful because it shows that um, you, you see uh, the right to freedom of expression and its exercise in a broader context. Implicated in the exercise of that right are those wishing to impart information, those wishing to receive it, and thirdly, uh, those who would potentially be affected by it as uh, third parties or general members of society. So much for the uh, necessary preliminary background. The rationales for enhanced uh, freedom of expression for journalists or the media. Um, I suppose the central point that I'll be making today is that 
this recognition of enhanced protection for journalists and, and media actors is intuitively sound, but theoretically flawed. Okay, it's probably um, it's, it's, it's probably a good outcome in light of the broader democratic enhancing objectives of the convention, but it's it it, it requires a more thorough theorization. Uh, here are the three rationales that have been um, more or less uh, put forward by the by the court for uh, recognizing. Uh, a higher level of protection for freedom of expression for journalists and media. And they all have to do with the tasks that are traditionally ascribed to journalists and the media in democratic so society. Certainly it's European uh, uh, version. Um, first of all, there's the reach and impact. Um, that would be associated more with the media than journalists. Um, and it focuses more on the infrastructural uh, side and the consequences of the ability to reach wide audiences. And that's then, uh, I suppose, the, the, the ability to disseminate information and ideas is then amplified in, in the case of certain technologies. And again, the court has recognized that as, as an important distinguishing factor for the protection of, of uh, freedom of expression of the media. Um, so the impact, uh, the court, implicitly links that to its reach. Um, the second one is more expressly uh, or is, is closer to the journalistic uh, task, such as that may be. Um, and that's the public watchdog uh, role or the uh, fourth estate. So the idea that uh, journalists would monitor uh, any malpractice or shortcomings of uh, the other organs of state and 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 uh, be quick to to bark um, uh, and highlight and expose any wrongdoing or, or malpractice on their part. Uh, foreign provision. This is a more recent addition to the uh, rationales for the enhanced level of freedom of expression of the media, and it uh, at the heart of this idea is that the media because of their technological capacities, would create a forum in which information and ideas could be, um, could, could, could be shared and disseminated. Now, already here, we see something important uh, uh, emerging. Um, and I said that this is a recent development. Um, and we will see then later on that uh, we're moving gradually from, um, we're moving gradually towards a broader notion of public debate and participation in public debate. So, whereas, a task like the public watchdog will remain relevant and important. There is also this new function that's that's uh, um, being assigned to the media, uh, at least in the court size. Okay, um, there are the three. Um, I've distilled them out of the case law. The case law is actually um, quite messy and and, and haphazard. Uh, it doesn't rest on any grand theory of uh, how the journalists and and and, and uh, how journalists and uh, media professionals can contribute to the enhancement of democracy. Um, they're the rationales. What does it mean in practice? Well, um, what you've got is um, uh, a number of different specific freedoms that have been recognized by the court as being instrumental for the realization of uh, journalist tasks in society. So, in identifying these freedoms, uh, the court has actually uh, sought to engage with some of the specificities of the sector, such as the perishability of news, um, the, the uh, omnipresence of deadlines, working to those deadlines, not having adequate time to um, check uh, perhaps all of the facts, uh, 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 but still wanting to get the story out because of its importance for public affairs, and indeed the public's right uh, to know, the public's right to receive information that relates to uh, um, public affairs uh, and matters of public interest. So that's the, 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 the general um, context in which this, this has uh, taken place. So a number of the, I, to itemize a few of them, first of all there's the freedom to report and comment on matters of public <coughs> interest. Okay, so what's important there is that uh, um, what I just mentioned, namely um, a recognition of, of, of the uh, impact of deadlines on the reporting task and um, also a freedom to rely, for example, on official reports that may have been produced by the government or an NGO or anybody without 
having to go and check all the facts and the content yourselves as journalists or media. And uh, that, that's important because, I mean, it's, it's, it's just one of the realities of journalism that you won't have that time uh, uh, or the resources to do that. So there's a recognition of, of, of um, the reasonableness of assuming that information that's out there can, in, in, in many circumstances, be trustworthy without having to do your own fact-finding. Presentational and editorial freedom. Okay, the locus classicus for uh, media freedom um, uh, in the European Court of Human Rights was the so-called Yersild case. I in that case, um, a journalist went out to, th there had been reports in the press uh, of um, an, uh, 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 an extreme right-wing movement in Copenhagen, skinheads, they were known as the Green Jackets, and there had been reports in the press about their activities and their views. Uh, Jørsild was a television journalist working for a serious news program on Danish public TV. He went to interview these uh, members of this group and uh, his report was presented in the context of a primetime news report. Um, it was an edited uh, piece and there wasn't a, a, an explicit distancing of the reporter from the views of the um, of, of of the green jackets that were aired in the in the in the news report, the thinking of the journalist and the editorial approach was well. Look, these ideas are ridiculous. Uh, they're self defeating, and the, 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 that will be obvious to the to the to the viewers. That we we don't need to um, tear them apart um, proactively. It'll it'll all be uh, self evident. Now. Um, the journalist and editor were subsequently prosecuted for aiding and, uh, and found guilty of aiding and abetting in the dissemination of racist views. That was challenged all the way uh, in Denmark um, without success and subsequently uh, the case was taken to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. One of the crucial findings in the Yersel case, which found uh, when the court found that there had indeed been a violation of the journalist's freedom of expression, was that it's not the place of the courts to second-guess journalists and editors on uh, the most appropriate um, technique for conveying a message of importance to the public. So again, this was a very important recognition of presentational and editorial freedom for uh, journalists. Um, protection of sources, that speaks for itself. Um, and protection, and then we move on to a more fundamental level here, protection against search of um, either the workplace or the private domicile of uh, journalists or media, media professionals, and uh, seizure of materials, um, specifically those that have been used for uh, reporting and news gathering purposes. Protection against physical violence and intimidation. This is important, uh, obviously, it's people's lives who are on the line. Um, but the European Court of Human Rights has gone so far as to recognize a positive obligation on states to take active measures to ensure the, um, the, the, the protection of uh, uh, news professionals and, 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 and journalists and that. This becomes very relevant in, um, in contemporary times. If you look at, um, you know, if, if, if journalists uh, working for big newspapers, for example, had been subjected to threats in the past, uh, you know, then this positive obligation on states would have kicked in and they would have had to take maybe security measures to ensure um, some sort of appropriate protection. What happens, as is increasingly the case nowadays, when individual bloggers um, would be threatened because of their uh, uh, online output? Would that positive obligation necessarily extend to them? Traditionally, this has been directed at journalists uh, and media professionals. Where do we stand with other actors who are now increasingly uh, active in, 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 in the changed uh, 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 environment? Yeah. Is, is there any, any um, sense of where the boundary between blogger and journalist, like is there a working legal definition of a journalist uh, for the court? Um, no. Um, and this is what I, what I want to get to in... Um, well, basically now, thank you. Um, as I say, the, the, the traditional, and this is the terminological um, troubleshooting that I, that I wanted to do. Traditionally, when the court has been discussing these issues, it has focused on the notions of journalist 
uh, and then uh, more recently and in certain circumstances, the media. And I think this is very problematic because both terms, if you talk about journalism or the media, um, now these are convenient shorthand terms, but they're such, they mask such an inherent variety in different types of journalism or media. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's often uh, unhelpful actually just to talk in, in, in these monolithic terms. And this is where the lack of a well thought through theory on the part of the court um, becomes problematic. Because uh, if you had set out your stall theoretically and say, well, uh, let's look at the reasons for this and let's really develop uh, them, then you would be able to pinpoint with greater accuracy when these uh, uh, freedoms would be applicable to a greater range of actors. What you see gradually and piecemeal uh, on the part of the court in its case law is a, a, a shift away from the uh, a functionalist approach, uh, from an, uh, from an occu occupational approach to a more functionalist one. And um, if I'll get on, uh, the, the, the next slide that I had was to um, show, you know, uh, perhaps a historical, but then uh, um, perhaps a, a somewhat naive uh, view of what the press uh, should do. And well, just be yeah. before you get to that, on the, um, the previous slide in the freedom of expression in the Yertel, Yertel case, Yertel, yeah. um, it, is the holding limited to journalists? I mean, do the, or is it, does it cover all Article 10, uh, all beneficiaries of Article 10? Well, you see, um, the court was focusing on the specific facts of the case. Right. So, um, that was the, 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 the context in which the principle was articulated. And what I'll get onto in a second is that, you know, it, it's perhaps time for a second coming of your soul, um, uh, or a, re, a rethinking of those principles in a radically changed uh, uh, environment. Your soul case was from 94, and, you know, that's nearly 20 years ago, so we've, we've, we've moved on considerably. And um, then the question for the court would be, you know, uh, how logical is it to extend that to all beneficiaries? Or would there be objections of, princ in, uh, of principle for not doing so? And I think that's, that's, that's a Gordian knot that they just have to cut, and they have to cut uh, urgently. But we'll see that there is some movement in, in, in that direction now in a moment. Um, please get back to me if uh, I don't answer it more fully later. So here's the role set out for the press, to provide a full, truthful, comprehensive and intelligent account of the day's events in a context which gives them meaning. Serve as a forum for the exchange of comment and criticism and be a common carrier of the public expression. Uh, pro project a representative picture of the constituent groups in the society. Present and clarify the goals and values of the society. I'm sure many of you recognize this and where it comes from. It's the uh, Hutchins uh, Commission. And uh, again, fast forward to 2013, how many of the media that you uh, conventionally consult would fulfill these obligations. This was a very, um, a, a very particular conceptualization of journalism, one of uh, resting on the social responsibility theory. But you've got myriad other kinds of, of, of journalism. Um, you know, you could have advocacy or other forms of partisan journalism. And again, they make up a more complex whole. And certainly with the lower entry barriers to um, you know, public expression today, I think that diversity has, 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 has uh, uh, expanded exponentially. So again, uh, and there was a great title uh, of, of uh, an article by Jokai Benkler, um, what was it, the, uh, the uh, a free irresponsible press and the battle for the soul of the networked fourth estate. And uh, uh, that captures, uh, I think, an awful lot of the, of the changes that have, that have, that have taken place uh, in the uh, media sector. Um, so the doctrinal developments uh, at the European Court of Human Rights, which are relevant to this new challenge of, you know, how much, uh, to what extent should, should uh, enhanced freedom of expression apply to other actors. And again, it's maybe important to emphasize at this stage that I'm not talking about ordinary freedom of expression, which everyone enjoys, but a, a, more, um, a more tailored and therefore enhanced uh, uh, form of that extra protection, if you like. The first one is that the um, convention is a living instrument. It was always designed to grow with the times. Uh, and that's important, uh, as people like 
Jack Balkan and others have said that, you know, more th the more a society comes to depend uh, on technology for its various activities, the more the realization of their rights will also become dependent on access to those te technologies. And that's very much the case for um, participation in the media and uh, how you seek, receive and impart uh, content through the media. It has to be practical and effective. This is, this is another uh, interpretive doctrine for the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, rights and remedies cannot be theoretical and illusory. They have to be practical and effective. So what does that mean? If, if you only have a, a, a right to access the more traditional forms of media, then it's not going to be uh, practical and effective in the modern day. You have to have you know, uh, access to the full plenitude of, um, of, of, of uh, the media, media offer available. Enhanced in freedom, for, freedom for, for, uh, of expression for the media. This has to be continued albeit in an adapted way. Uh, responsible I do have to just ask, because I haven't heard yet, what is the enhanced, what is the enhanced protection? That was a few slides ago. Well, you, I, Yurta, but it's not clear that, that, that the Yurta or the freedom of, of, that that holding applied only to journalists, right? So if I'm an individual, yeah. I might have the same protection. Is it clear that journalists are getting more protection in, in defamation or in, um, in other realms where they may be sued? Yeah, well, the, the, these um, these are the these are kind of the 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 the, the areas in which uh, that enhanced freedom becomes noticeable. One, but editorial freedom. Yeah. Is that is, do, does the press have more editorial freedom than an individual? Oh, it's just as well you brought me back to that. I forgot to mention a crucial thing. Uh, the the press uh, under the, this banner of presentational and editorial freedom, the the press have the recognized right to, on occasion, have recourse to exaggeration and provocation um, insofar as that may be um, central to how they wish to convey their message and the technique that they're using to trigger uh, further public debate. So, uh, that individuals don't have. Yeah, okay. I, and again, that is uh, uh, index linked to the um, role that, 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 that the, the, the journalist should um, have in society. Okay? Um, the final element. Okay, responsible journalism. Right, as I mentioned in the introduction, the trade-off for this enhanced protection uh, for freedom of expression is the expectation of adheren adherence to, edi uh, to ethical uh, codes and, 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 and uh, uh, ethical, ethical guides and uh, guidelines and codes and standards. And now in Europe, the journalistic sector is typically self-regulated. So the standards that govern the operation of journalism would be developed by the sector themselves and they would be positioned within the broader uh, parameters of civil and, and criminal law. This becomes very relevant because one of the things that was central in Yersold was a recognition of kind of the, the subjectivity of judgment calls. And again, um, various people have written uh, on this. M Michael Shudson uh, there recently was, was talking about um, one of the understated uh, roles of, of, of institutionalized journalism, namely that uh, ability to select and judge uh, um, news, the newsworthiness of news. And I found that an interesting, an interesting angle. Um, but there has to be this uh, measure of subjectivity involved uh, in order for journalists to, 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 to function optimal, optimally. However, um, in, in some recent case law, the Court of, the European Court of Human Rights is uh, placing uh, increased importance on that, and there has been a lot of um, a lot of uh, negative and critical reaction to that, both from within the court in the form of dissenting opinions, and in academia. And the reason is quite self-explanatory. Once you start to codify um, the ethical uh, responsibilities of journalists in legal terms, um, they, it becomes a bit of a, a list of boxes that have to be ticked and fulfilled, and that could in itself have a, a chilling effect on uh, the right to freedom of expression. Um, also, um, it, it, uh, the, f the flip side is that once you start insisting in legal terms on um, codes and, 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 and guidelines which have been developed by sectors, uh, by, by the sector, 
how does it work then with other actors who are involved in contributing to public debate? Is it legitimate? Is it reasonable to expect bloggers, for instance, to exercise the same ethical um, guidelines that would uh, pertain to the journalistic sector, which very often are developed through training uh, and, and uh, also institutionalized uh, practices? Okay, this is a, this is a very difficult uh, call. This enhanced freedom for, for uh, of exp enhanced freedom of expression for the media needs to be extended to a wider range of actors. We'll see that in a minute, um, and the, the 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 court is already doing this because um, first of all, in a, in a case called um, excuse me, Steele and Morris against the UK, which involved uh, uh, an environmental activist group campaigning against McDonald's for. Um, uh, 101 reasons. They were distributing um, pamphlets in London. Uh, McDonald's sued them for defamation. It was a very protracted uh, uh, um, uh, case in the UK. Um, and in the end, the, 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 the UK courts found in favour of McDonald's. When the courts went to Strasbourg, there were no, a number of interesting principles uh, established by the court. The most, most important, perhaps, for, for, for this presentation was that even, it's, that, that contributions to public debate should not be the preserve of the media uh, in their institutionalized incarnation, but also individual, uh, also campaign groups and indeed ordinary individuals have their uh, right uh, to contribute to public debate, and that needs to be uh, underscored. Uh, by legal recognition. So that was a very important development. Subsequently, the court went on in other cases to recognize... This Ross Rossberg uh, disagreed with uh, the UK court? Yeah. 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 Um, so in subsequent cases, this has been um, developed even further uh, to say that, um, uh, for example, NGOs should have a right to access uh, official information because of what the court called their social watchdog um, um, function. So it moves away from a public watchdog uh, uh, to a social one, uh, but it was nevertheless a further expansion of the underlying idea. Following up on that question, were, were they saying thing, defamation implies that there's untruthfulness to them, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and then in the U.S., I think, you have to prove that there was a, um, a malicious intent. So was that the, re the reasoning that the court had? I mean... No, it's, it's, it's a more uh, convoluted affair in the, in, in the UK, <laughs> the evidentiary uh, standards and that. Uh, and the, I think the issue was, uh, you know, whether some of the specific um, allegations were false. Uh, and what the court found was that the, um, the overall tenor uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the criticisms was more important than the, maybe some of the individual allegations um, and that taken as a whole the uh, contribution by the activists was a, a, a contribution to public debate and that that was more important than uh, from yeah, a free speech expression. Or if it were an individual? Uh, well this is what they were saying that th these were individuals and I suppose it's enhanced but it's not really in here. In other words, these are now individual response rights. Yeah, yeah. This is this is what is gradually being recognized by the court. So what I'm trying to, to show here is a shift in its thinking, a broadening of that enhanced protection but to it also changes the meaning of defamation. Um need to think about that and discuss it with you. Uh uh, well, it might afterwards, the scope of liability for def defamation, if not its meaning. Yeah, it, it, it could do if if you were to follow if you were to follow it follow it through um, follow through on it sufficiently. Um, again, what the what the court in Strasbourg was looking at was more the broader freedom of expression um, consequences rather than the, the 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 ins and outs of the UK defamation law as 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 such. The UK is always an outlier anyway in terms of libel, right? That's why there's so much libel tourism for yeah. Americans. Yeah. 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 Um, so this is a shift that's taking place in expansion. Um, an awareness of specific features of the online environment. Um, I'll just accelerate here a little bit, but gradually 
um, the court is coming to recognise that um, the internet has introduced uh, that the internet has basically been a game changer for freedom of expression and how um, public debate is is conducted. Uh, and again, in a very piecemeal way, you've got the court recognising the uh, importance of internet archives for historical research and for chronicling um, social de uh, so societal developments at a given time. You also see that um, because of the uh, recognition of the abundance of information that's out there and how um, this will require adjusted and more um, careful um, verification procedures on the part of um, those who are processing and, and, and further disseminating information and so on. So gradually um, the court is catching up with uh, the realities of the new communicative dispensation. Technological and practical developments, there's a much greater diversity of actors involved now um, and all of them have uh, different functionalities. Um, there are alternatives to institutionalized structures and processes. Um, People have talked about the fragmentation of the fourth estate, the individualization or the re-individualization of free uh, expression, and also uh, to some extent the re the subsequent reinstitutionalization of freedom of expression. I see yesterday, for instance, um, just an announcement that um, there's a new deal been done between Twitter and major um, uh, media organizations called Twitter Amplify. Um, and th this will explore uh, synergies between them at the distribution level so that the content circulating on Twitter will be uh, um, uh, distri further distributed uh, through partnership organizations. Um, diversification in types of contributions. Uh, in the past it was much more straightforward. Um, content would be offered and uh, consumed in, 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 in different ways. Now there are other um, um, actors involved who wouldn't necessarily be um, um, shoveling um, content towards you but merely um, providing a search function and then you've got um, various other um, uh, forms of contribution to public debate. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then all of this has led to a swirl of competition in the first instance, but then subsequent complementarity between um, the different actors involved. That Twitter example is, is a case in point. Uh, um, the competition might have been, for example, uh, how traditional uh, newsrooms would have opposed uh, or had a certain resistance to the idea of aggregators, uh, aggregating sites, whereas now you see a more nuanced relationship in that um, there could be uh, incorporation or synergies or uh, strategic use of each other. Um, and then collaboration, uh, the emergence of user-generated content in all forms of participati participatory journalism and the uh, growing um, uh, potential in, in that um, area. Okay, so here uh, just uh, uh, to take away from the, the uh, sterility of the text, um, we'll just kind of liven it up with a few examples of the different actors and um, instantly when you look at these you'll, you'll realize the different functionalities that they preserve, uh, um, that they, pers that they um, offer and again they can make very very different contributions uh, to uh, public debate. Um, okay so it's all up in the air at the moment um, you see um, all of the different types of media trying to uh, uh, find out uh, what their precise place is and this has led to a number of challenges. Um, um, you know, there's, there's, as I said at the beginning, as I've proved in my presentation, it's all quite messy. So the, the big challenge is to join the dots and to be aware of what the um, regulatory, uh, the relevant regulatory and policy dots are. Um, and if you don't, you may end up with, uh, you know, wishful thinking or Santa Claus-like uh, um, approaches. And I think this is one of the great challenges for law and policy makers uh, in Europe and elsewhere, to be aware of where you're coming from, to be aware of, uh, you know, the principles, uh, as uh, the legal principles as they have been uh, developed thus far, and to ensure that any adaptation of them for the new uh, recalibrated environment will be faithful to the underlying premises, but be sufficiently flexible to take uh, account of the new realities. The Council of Europe has made one attempt, um, one kind of concerted attempt to um, set out a, a roadmap for the, for the future uh, in, in a politically 
well, political recommendation to its member states, which is called the New Notion of Media. And again, um, they, they plead for a graduated uh, approach or differentiated approach to regulation and policy that would open up um, the necessary space for uh, all the different kinds of media to, to contribute to public, public debate. However, the, the text is, to my mind, riddled with, 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 with um, you know, terminological inconsistencies and uh, mis matches of, 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 of concepts. Um, so I think it, it, it's very much a work in progress. Um, and then what I think we need to do is to get back to the um, underlying principles and purposes. This is something that I've borrowed from uh, Michael uh, Shudson's re recent article. I found it very useful. Um, um, what he does is he, um, he, he talks about the need for a, a pluralistic set of new stewardships for democracy. And I think the exercise that he has done here is useful, and I'd love to see uh, other similar exercises to this. What he has done is he has set out uh, a range of functions that could be undertaken by journalists or other actors, um, which are important for uh, a kind of serving of the public interest in the sphere of, of public communications. This is something that I think needs to be done more systematically uh, um, by, by, by uh, regulatory uh, authorities and policymakers, because it forces them to think about the rationales for the freedom and, and, and then the enhanced freedom and then it makes it, uh, as I said in the beginning, that bit easier to pinpoint where they should kick in, with what consequences, etc. Um, first of all, he identifies policing truthfulness in political discourse, then uh, constructing new communities of investigative journalism, reinventing local news coverage, looking for comparative advantage in analysis, incorporating crowds into serving journalism's core mission, and accepting the legitimacy of non journalism accountability organizations, so typically NGOs, and uh, elsewhere he is referred to that as adjunct journalism. What you see here is a broad resonance with some of the directions that the court is already going in. But this, would, this kind of um, thought exercise is, uh, I think, a useful stimulus to the court to think it through a little bit more. You see that um, among the results of these initiatives could be greater participation in public debate um, uh, and, and a recognition of the different types of um, journalism or contributions to public uh, debate. Um, I'll leave it at that for the moment. I'm sure there's plenty of uh, uh, um, thoughts, comments, criticisms, uh, whatever. So uh, I'd be delighted to hear any comparative insights from you or any questions, uh, comments you, you may have. Yeah. Um, well, a comparative insight, which I'm sure you know, but um, you know, so in the, in the U.S. courts, uh, the U.S. courts have always taken a functional approach to what is journalism. And, have really been presented head on with this question always because the First Amendment mentions the press as an institution and freedom of expression more generally. And the courts have always said that that doesn't mean that the press gets any special privileges in terms of freedom of expression. Um, so in a sense, you know, I think the US law has been doing this for a very long time. Not, there's been no, almost no press exceptionalism. Um, with the exceptions of positive rights, sort of the, the, the um, shield laws, and those in most states, I think, have now come to define journalists very broadly and would include bloggers in many cases. So I think this is already sort of well on its way in the U.S. But So what I wanted to ask, um, though, were your thoughts on this question, which is about power relationships between you know, the press and the government on the one hand and press and individuals and how people fight back against the press and how the press fights back against yep. the government and what tools they have yep. um, and that those really need to be re-examined and it might be that they don't only go towards ratcheting up freedom of expression for the press but that they might also go towards um, tamping it down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's an excellent point and that, that word assumption is, is, is crucial because uh, if you look at how the um, um, European Court of Human Rights approaches these issues. This is a body of um, um, judges, depending on of varying in numbers, depending on whether it's a chamber or a grand chamber. But in any case, these will not be uh, communication scientists with the uh, sophistication of analysis that you would have within that discipline. So very often, when they set out the reasons for um, giving this so-called enhanced 
uh, freedom to freedom of expression, they will refer to 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 the reach and impact without um, you know uh, bo uh, without boiling that down and examining the different ways in which uh, impact can be realized either at the individual or group or societal level and you miss out there on 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 uh, a, a great sophistication that is very well developed uh, you know in in in, um, in 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 some scholarly disciplines um, for example the you know it, it, it almost it doesn't quite but it almost goes back to the uh, uh, hypodermic model that oh, oh there is reach therefore there is impact whereas the reality is, is is much more nuanced and and you're absolutely right I mean it could lead to greater um, um, freedoms or privileges I didn't use the word rights but uh, deliberately but these freedoms or privileges or it could uh, have the opposite effect but either way I think it, uh, a, a greater theorization would lead to uh, increased clarity uh, about the about the exercise, and um, it would give us just uh, m m it would I think lead to more consistency uh, in the approach taken. One other thing that I should have mentioned is that when the any time um, the court looks at freedom of expression and and tries to determine whether there has been a violation of freedom of expression, um, it will engage with a range of contextual factors. Um, that uh, could be relevant um, to the to the case. So um, again, one that I mentioned was um, the level of interest uh, to public public debate that would then um, you know plead in favour of, of of protection. Uh, another might be um, if uh, offensive remarks are uttered in the heat of a live studio debate and there's no real opportunity to correct them or prevent them then you just have to accept that that's the particular format being used and that the composition of the of the um, of the panel for example in, in, in the example I'm thinking of that that balanced it out and you know that's just part and parcel of the uh, of the of the uh, uh, discursive or debating uh, exercise well, I, um, I have a, I have a question that sort of an odd one, which is um, the role of the commission. So in the Television Without Frontiers adjustment to the audiovisual directive, you had the commission trying to deal with the transformation of the video industry. Is there any equivalent interest in thinking about the transformation of the press by the commission? Yeah, um, there is the whole digital agenda that's um, um, uh, flavor of the month and has been for many months uh, at, uh, at EU level, and it's particularly the, the European Commission that's 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 driving that. Um, uh, what I was focusing today uh, on today was more the the, the court of human rights, um, and um, um, so that was an attempt to contain the messiness of the of the subject matter. But yes, you're you're, you're absolutely right. There's there's that huge uh, uh, debate going on um, at the level of the of, of the uh, digital agenda, and that's something. And I guess my question is, where is their competence and um, and skill, and are they addressing? Do they preempt the not exactly preempt, but basically overrun the court by their expertise? Um, well, it's two. It's two different. Um, it's two different bodies. Um, so the the the, the 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 issue of competence wouldn't wouldn't really uh, um, in, enter into play there. Um, there have been some developments at the European Court of Justice. By competence, here I mean skill, not. Um, oh right, right. Um, there there has been there has been some interaction be, 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 between them. Um, but uh, the the commission is is pretty much running running its own show um, in that respect and reaching out to to the stakeholders that it sees as as relevant. Um, what's going on at the Council of Europe is largely uh, an internal dynamic uh, and uh, uh, which which has been driven, uh, I think, primarily by by um, by the the courts the courts judgments. I guess the, the, the question is, does this become an issue of industrial policy as much as this, does the industrial policy of this overtake the free speech question? In other words, maybe this goes to the uh, question of um, the court almost um, 
catching up and dealing with facts on the ground that have transformed how people function. And that for that reason, it's, an, it's a task that can better be ta undertaken by something like the commission than by the court in trying to redefine roles. Yeah, I, I, think you, I think you've put your finger on it there. It's, it's exactly that. It's a catch-up exercise by the court. Um, but when it comes to um, you know, policy making for the future, that's more a task for um, the European Commission uh, in the context of the EU, and that they're pursuing that in that way. They're, they're, they're engaging with stakeholders and trying to have a multi-perspectival uh, uh, development of relevant policies. And within the Council of Europe, then, it will be more a task for the Committee of Ministers. And um, at the end of this year, they'll be uh, reaching out to the um, uh, relevant ministers of member states to get um, uh, basically a roadmap for their media-related policy for the next uh, four, four or five years or so. So, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. It's a, the, the, the more um, policy-oriented approach is not a task for the court, um, but for other bodies, both at the European uh, Union and, and the uh, Council of Europe. Uh, there's a few other questions here. Uh, I, I saw Joe's hand. I talk a lot. So you <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as you move from an occupational <coughs> you could introduce a degree of subjectivity on either the speaker's side or the listener's side. You could say on the speaker's side, if there was a good faith intent to pursue one of these goals, then we should protect it whether or not it actually ended up <laughs> serving that purpose. Or on the listener's side, you could say, if it could be reasonably perceived as pursuing one of these uh, purposes, it should be protected. And I'm just wondering if you've seen any developments on either side of that in, in pursuing a functional perspective. Yeah, th thank you. Th these would typically be considerations that would enter into play in, in the context of, of uh, uh, contextual uh, uh, factors that, that, that could be relevant in, in individual cases. Um, certainly, um, both, both of these uh, criteria have been included in the um, political recommendation that I mentioned, uh, the new no uh, a new notion of media. Uh, what the intent of the, of the uh, speaker is and how that message would be perceived uh, by uh, readers. The other um, criteria applied in that um, uh, include, well, I'll just read them to you, um, purpose and underlying objectives of media, so that was your first one, editorial control, so second, professional standards, outreach and dissemination, and public expectation, which is your second one. So again, they've been factored into the discussion, um, and now it's a case of seeing how that will be developed subsequently. And that ministerial conference that I mentioned at the end of this year, I think will uh, revisit some of these issues and see where they should be going. Uh, so. Joe, and then uh, oh. some. Of, I, I'm try, I don't know enough about the European Court of Human Rights, but um, the, the functional approach concerns me too. Uh, and I, it, with all due respect to Michael, um, it's really hard to understand when you look at those words what they mean. Yeah. Um, the, the, um, um, it's a class of argument. Um, journalism is a class, the, the, the normative approach to journalism that the Hutchins Committee took is a very class-based notion of what news is about. Mm -hmm. And it's, it seems to me highly problematical to talk about the functions and the intentions and the, 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 what the public will get out of it when the notions of news are so different among so many lines of yeah. society. Yeah. Um, the, it, it seems to me dangerous almost to talk about the enhanced um, uh, rights of a journalist because then you begin to define who a journalist is. Yeah. Uh, so I think a lot of this is a real slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, there, 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 I think there, there, there are a few um, considerations here. First of all, it, I, I think we're, it's, it's important to realize the kind of um, legal heritage that, that um, defines the European Convention on, on Human Rights. And um, that's reflected 
uh, at least in part by this insistence on uh, duties and responsibilities that go with the exercise of the right to freedom of expression and uh, a perception or an assumption that um, there is a, 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 a democratic role to be fulfilled uh, by the media. Again, an awful lot of this has its, has its uh, roots in the experiences of the Second World, World War and that. But it is, it's very much, I think, uh, I, th I think it's a lot less controversial in, in, in Europe than it would be in the States for constitutional and cultural and a whole host of, of, of other um, reasons. But uh, fully accept your, your point about the slippery slope uh, the dangers of a slippery slope there. And um, I think that, um, and also the differentiation in news, and I think that's why it's important for the court to get it right on this issue and to get it right now. Because, um, you know, the, the, I, I think once, once you start um, looking at um, definitions uh, uh, of, of particular types of, of, of actors, uh, indeed, that, that, that can be very limiting for free speech. What I found useful about Michael's approach is that he just starts thinking about what's, what's underneath. So, I mean, if you choose, if you choose other words, uh, fine, but it, it, it kind of, what it does for me is it opens up the diversity of uh, tasks, and that's why, why I said that I would like to see other exercises like this, because you could have different emphases in that, but the, um, the overall impact of that kind of um, setting out of these, these different functions is that there uh, comes a greater awareness of um, uh, you know, what, what, what is instrumental uh, for freedom of expression. Thinking, for example, constructing new communities of investigative journalism. You know, WikiLeaks is a community of investigative journalism. And I mean, we could say that's terrific or it's not, but that sentence opens up a world of mm. discourse, discussion. Mm -hmm. But I don't see how a court could even begin to to think about making normative judgments about that. I, I just mm. well, I suppose what I'm getting is is the um, <laughs> you're, you're eager to get in on that. Well, I, I mean, I, it seems to me that that I mean that's precisely the point in a way for me. What where this seems to be edging towards, if you're really going to go to a pure functionalist approach, is taking journalism out of the question altogether. Right, that's I what I'm suggesting. It's becoming American, right? I mean, that's what, American, right? I mean, that's no, what but, you're saying. But there, I, right? That's exactly what I, I'm saying. I think that is the broad movement, um, you know, to, 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 to get away from um, that term that was just a default term back in the day. Um, and, and that, but because it was never fully theorized, um, you know, that uh, process uh, is, is, is gradual. But I think that's, we, we can see uh, in embryonic form that, that, uh, that there are indications that that is where the court is going. And I think it's important that that be continued and indeed ac accelerated and properly, properly theorized, as I, as I say. Sorry for keeping you on hold. Two very brief questions. Um, are issues of digital divide off the map in Europe for, for a body like this one? in terms of, you know, infrastructure for access to information, one. And two, to what extent in your analysis do you look, you know, you mentioned the, the, the case with, uh, with the Danish um, um, courts. Um, to what extent do you focus on the tensions between kind of national courts? And, uh, like, is that a process of European yeah. harmonization of these, of, these um, um, uh, of, of freedom of expression um, laws or norms more generally? Or what, what exactly is going on? That's what I couldn't get a sense. Yeah, In the Danish okay. case, it seems that you know there's a sense yeah. of okay. hierarchy. Okay, um, two, two, two very good questions. Thank you. Um, the first one, um, digital divide. The, the court is limited to dealing with the issues that come before it. Uh, it's not a policy-making organ, so it just has to stick to um, what, whatever um, whatever is you know comes before it. Um, and it's precisely what Monroe said a few minutes ago. It's a it's a catch-up exercise. Um, just uh, at the end of 2012, uh, the court engaged frontally with uh, uh, some internet-related issues. Uh, that was the Yildirim uh, case against Turkey, uh, in which um, the applicant to the court in Strasbourg uh, was unable to access his own websites because, for a period of time, um, Google sites were blocked um, for a reason that had nothing to do with him. So um, the court. Uh, you know, experts would say that the court was waiting for uh, a black and white case that they could, you know, engage with and then set a precedent for, uh, for, for internet related issues. This was it. And then the court recognized on the way to f 
finding that there had been a violation of the applicant's uh, freedom of expression through the inability to access the Google uh, Google sites. That you know uh, that these sites and indeed other internet-based uh, uh, resources were an important uh, resource and, 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 and forum for creativity and for freedom of expression. Boom, there's your principle. And now that they've, that they've, that they've uh, recognized this, they will surely develop that in subsequent case law. But you know, it was just a case of waiting for, uh, and there's a huge backlog at the court, huge backlog. I mean, you're, you're talking about years and years. Um, so that uh, partly, so the, the delay in engaging with these uh, um, internet-related specificities was partly um, physical almost, because of the backlogs, but it was also political, that, that there was perhaps a certain uh, 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 reluctance uh, or uncertainty about how to proceed. But gradually, uh, it's, it's going in that direction. Now, about the um, hierarchy or possible conflict, the, the, the structure is that um, if you find that your right to freedom of expression has been violated, you have to go through all available, um, um, you have to exhaust all uh, uh, national remedies that are so available. Yeah, and the way that they uh, that the court uh, looks at uh, alleged violations of freedom of expression is that they um, they have you were asking about the procedures. They've got a number. Uh, they've got a, a kind of a three-step test. Once it's established that there's um, uh, there's been an interference with the right to freedom of expression, they ask uh, um, was it provided uh, was it provided for by law? Did it pursue a le legitimate aim? And uh, is it necessary in a in a, in a democratic society? That's the, the shortest possible explanation of, of, of how they examine it. But for that criterion, that all-important criterion na um, uh, necessary in democratic society, their, um, how they interpret that is not just desirable or useful or whatever. It has to correspond to a pressing social need. And then the, the impugned measure has to be proportionate and the reasons uh, 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 put forward by the state for adopting it have to be relevant and sufficient. So that's the the, the, the formal the formal answer. But um, um, so, yeah. A momentary silence. Can I just thank you all very much? First of all, for coming. I know it's out of term, and this is when uh, this is very often when serious uh, productivity takes place yeah. in academia. So I really appreciate you all coming, and thanks very much for the. Uh, for the input. I think this is something that I'm, I'm going to continue to work on, so I might uh, be very grateful if I might be able to send an email to a few of you there who've uh, uh, challenged me and, and try and uh, try and meet your challenge later on. Uh, th Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you, Monroe.